to promote. Everyone is creative. A creative life requires bravery and action, honesty and hard work. We are here to support you, celebrate you, and encourage you to make the things you love. We believe in the power of community. We believe in giving a damn. We believe in face-to-face -face connections, in learning from others, in hugs and high fives. We bring together people who are driven by passion and purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in their neighborhoods and cities around the world. Everyone is welcome. I'm going to go over just a few of our uh, sponsors that we have going up. We have some amazing people that help make this work. This doesn't help without sponsorship and volunteers. So Killer Coffee for the coffee baking killer. Yep, yep, yep. That's a roast to order coffee straight out of OKC. So love it even more so. You've got Hand Making Studio. So Hand Making Studio is a place for creatives to work. A space for classes, art shows, and pop-up shows. They are passionate about empowering. empowering. Sorry, I got, okay, back up. I got distracted because it was doing the and then I my head up. And then I messed up all the words, so there's my mind. Good morning, it's Friday. I've had, I've had half a cup of coffee, and yeah, that's all right, okay? So they are passionate about empowering makers to create a safe place to explore creativity and community. Guernsey, Guernsey is Oklahoma City's largest employee owned architecture, engineering, and consulting firm. I just realized I was in front of the screen. Look over here, it's fine. So they deliver innovative and sustainable solutions to clients around the world. So thank you so much to them for providing the chairs, donuts. Chairs. Chair <laughs> Handmaking Studio, studio, they provided the donuts. So thank you guys so much for that. And then thank you so much for Verbode allowing us to be in this space. A better way to real estate. At Verbode, each client receives personalized service based on our uh, expertise, specializing in OKC's urban core and stellar in industry knowledge. And it's, it's beautiful. I can only imagine what real estate looks like. It's awesome. So um, thank you guys so much for the sponsors that are here. If you or you know a company that would like to sponsor, have them get with mail at the end. That'd be fantastic. Um, Everything helps to help push this movement here in OKC, us creatives. So um, we're going to get going with Councilman James Cooper. He's going to come and talk to us today. And I tried to channel, like you guys know Heaven is usually here, giving high fives and all that sort of stuff. And um, I tried to like channel my Heaven, like what's a question you would ask? And I, did, I didn't do it, so I just was like, give me a fun fact. Anyways, his fun fact is actually fantastic. I love it. He said the first live action movie that he saw, he was five years old, and the first one was Ferris Bueller's Day Off, <laughs> and, then the, and then Nightmare on Elm Street 3. So if you think about all of those things, yep, that's, that's a fun fact. So <laughs> let's give it up for James as he talks to us today. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. You'll be happy to know that I think the first animated film I saw was Care Bears, the movie, followed by Care Bears to the Next Generation. And I don't have, have y'all seen those? They're scary. I'm not kidding. Um, so, I want to thank everyone for uh, opening uh, this, this event to me. Uh, for both, thank you very much. It really means a lot. Mel, thank you for reaching out, Gary. I love your mission statement. This morning, I will have to take uh, two things that they said and, and ask for your assistance with them. I'm recovering from the flu, and that was with a flu shot. Uh, I'm mad. Uh, <laughs> So instead of high fives and hugs when you see me, I'm gonna have that jacket on over there. And if you wanna come say hi afterwards, we're gonna elbow. <laughs> and then by about Monday, if you see me out and about in our city, I should be fine. I'm already on your biology, you should be good. And I will high five you, I'll hug you if you get with your consent. And it'll <laughs> be just fine. Uh, so the theme this morning was invest. So I wanted to talk to you about how I decided to invest in our city as a council member. Now, for those of you who've heard me speak before, some of this is just going to sound as familiar as it can possibly be. However, 
However, like the Odyssey, sometimes stories are worth retelling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Welcome. <laughs> English major. <laughs> so, a couple of years ago, on my birthday, April 1st, I went for a walk. I live in the Pacific. And this particular walk took me from 28th Street, where today uh, Scratch and Oso call home. That's my street. <laughs> and I took a south turn on to do East. And as I did, I started to think about all the other people who were about to join me for this walk. And I started to think about where I was headed. And as I went for that walk, that first live action film I saw, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3, was really playing in my mind because I had gone to school as an undergrad for film studies and political science to study media violence. Columbine happened my junior year of high school. And when it happened, if you were a Democrat in the news, you knew who the culprit was. If you were a Republican in the news, you knew who the culprit was, and I'm very specifically talking about the late, great Senator John McCain. And I'm also talking about Secretary of State, former Senator, first lady Hillary Clinton. I have vivid memory of seeing both of them on the news saying, I know the culprit. It's Marilyn Manson, it's punk rock, <coughs> it's gangster rap, it's violent video games, it's horror movies. I took issue with that argument. Because as you just heard from that fun fact, one of the very first films I ever saw was Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3. And let me tell you what that story, that film taught me. That I wanted to be a writer. That's what it taught me. I wanted to tell stories. And moreover, I wanted to learn the history of storytelling. That's how I came to learn about Homer, and the Iliad, and the Odyssey, and the traveling bards who we went from town to town singing the stories before there was an opera. That's how I learned the epic of Gilgamesh told on a tablet. That's how I learned about the Blombos Kate, the very first examples we have of art. And that's in South Africa. And that's 100,000 years old. Now, how did I learn all that? It was because of my love of it, but it was also because I was ready to be wrong. So I went after Columbine into OU in the grad studies at OSU, studying media violence, I wanted to know what the actual causes of violent images are on our rights. That's what I wanted to know. And I was ready to be wrong. I was ready to find out that the stuff I had been watching, the stuff I had been playing, the stuff I had been listening to was the culprit. I was ready for that. Spoiler, I was right. <laughs> and what I also learned along the way was some research that more recent Stanford economics uh, studies just kind of affirmed for me in a much more concise way. It was something like this. For every year that a kiddo grows up in a better environment, she or he will earn more over their lifetime. Teen pregnancy rates go down, college chances go up. They have a more stable family environment. They're able to build community. These were the thoughts running through my head as I was walking on duty for 23rd Street. Also running through my head that morning were the other statistics from Stanford. And those said that the kids who were growing up in those not so better environments, these were the parts of town associated with crime, income inequality, segregation, and a lack of social cohesion. These were the thoughts as I got to the intersection of 2032. And I thought about my students at Jefferson Middle School on the south side of our city, about 66 in Blackwell. And I remembered as I started teaching there in 2015, now I'm single, I have a cat. She's great. Her name is Marion. She is the first cat of War II. <laughs> I promised her that all those days that her roommate, Latin me, was gone, knocking doors. Remember, I knocked doors from July 5th of 2018 until literally the night before the election, February 12th, 2019, teaching from 9.30 
9 a.m. to 4 p.m. and then going immediately to the north side of town where I live to knock doors. And I promised that cat that I was doing it so that we'd have some animal shelters. She was a rescue cat. I found her in hours of still water when I was doing that crap work. Now I don't know if she understands a single thing that I'm saying. <laughs> I don't care. I just needed to communicate that like I wasn't just out there, you know, roaming the streets the way she used to do that first year. <laughs> so as I continued on 23rd Street toward the, the state capitol, I was replaying the previous three years of Jefferson in my head. Now, because I'm single, because I have a cat, I don't really have a lot of financial responsibility. I'm one of those evil millennials you've heard about that doesn't own a home. Can't own a home. <laughs> Student loans. That takes the place of the mortgage for my generation. I'm sure you're reading this in the news, ladies and gentlemen. Exhibit A. That's cool. I had already come to realize that stuff, things, the accumulation of things don't bring happiness. I had started to think that maybe in this search for meaning and purpose, just People who were reading and hearing the Iliad and the Odyssey started thinking that maybe these are much deeper questions that can be solved by teaching. <laughs> so I don't need a lot, and I don't care. I have like a 700 foot apartment there for me. It's ideal. But let me tell you who I worried about. Who I worried about were the other teachers that I saw up and down the halls. They seemed to live in despair. And I think I know why. It's because back then, 2015, 16, 17, 18. The starting pay for a teacher was $31,000. These are people with student loans. These are people who did what was asked of them. They went to college. Yeah. They did what was asked of them. These aren't lazy layouts you never heard. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Pull themselves up by the bootstraps. They did. Yeah. And yet, the level of despair that I saw in those hallways, A Hall, B Hall, B Hall, C Hall, Jefferson, I will never be able to articulate that feeling that they, I mean, it was hard. And I'm guessing they also felt it because they had families. They had people they had to take care of. And then there were the kids. Who reminded me so much of the kids I had gone to school with out in the park talk talk. They're great. They're great. They're great. They're great kids. They're great kids. But the fights and the in-school suspensions and the out-of-school suspensions those were the thoughts that were in my head as I walked down 23rd Street that day. So there was despair in my brain, but there was hope because I saw that people had invested in 23rd Street, a part of town that many of you know with memories long enough, had also fallen into despair and disrepair and a lack of investment. But there was the drink. There was the truck taco. There was Tucker's. There was Pony. The outsiders. You can quotes on the wall in there. The beginning. So I saw that and I thought, okay, if the private sector is willing to do this work, surely the public sector is willing to invest in uprooting the rock, uprooting despair. But then I got closer to the capital. And I saw payday loan after payday loan after payday loan where there should be a grocery store. Yes, yes. And as I got closer to I-235, the sort of feverish chills I felt the last couple nights with the flu washed over me. Because I-235 is a barrier separating Ward 2 from Ward 7. Yep. It's almost like they don't want you to cross over to the Capitol. And there are no side the sidewalks are, are, are a joke. They're a cruel joke when you go under 235. By the way, you have, I think, about four traffic lanes you got a bunch of vehicles. And normally, sidewalks are supposed to have trees right here and then cars to protect the pedestrian. Yeah. Not there. Not there. And then the sidewalks just go, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing. And <laughs> then when I got to the state capitol, there were a couple state legislators. I love public Thank you so much for being here. Here's some donuts and coffee. But we're 
not going to do any more than that six thousand dollar raise with this kid. And I was like, look, I don't need no six thousand dollar raise. Marion's fine. She is fine. It's <laughs> good. I am good. Those babies, those seventh and eighth graders, they need counselors. Yeah. Because as you all know, and if you don't, here it comes. Oklahoma has some of the highest adverse childhood experience numbers on any earth. And what that means is there's a test about 10 questions. And once you get to about four, the cake is baked. Some of these questions are, did you experience neglect, food insecurity, physical abuse, sexual abuse? Did you listen to your parents fight all the time? Well, oh, well, once you start getting those numbers high enough, it's not just your mental health. It's not just anxiety and depression and bipolar, schizophrenia. It's not just your mental health that those experiences now shape you for as an adult. It's your physical health. Yeah. That's true. That's not a conspiracy. Don't believe me. Go type in adverse childhood experiences into that little Google. That's what our babies, that's what they're dealing with. And it gets passed down through the DNA, through the blood. That means that those kiddos in the womb, in the womb, in the womb are experiencing this. I felt so sick this week, but I had to come share this message. And even if it means I lose re-election in a few years, I will share this message until this city gets it right. Our kids' lives are on the line. I'm not being melodramatic. And that Nightmare on Elm Street 3 moment, that Nightmare on Elm Street 3 moment also played in my head that day during that walk. Because let me tell you a little quick synopsis for how many of you have seen Nightmare on Elm Street? <laughs> the girl who survives part one, Nancy. <laughs> Oklahoma's own. Oklahoma's own. Never mind me, yeah. So we are, remember that. <laughs> she survives that film. The plot of that film is that the parents were really mad, as I understand, because this guy had killed kids in the neighborhood. That's bad. That's bad. Don't do that. He gets off on a technicality at the courts. The parents take vigilante justice into their hands, burn him alive in his boyhood. Fast forward 15 years later, he haunts the children of those parents in their dream and kills them one by one in their dream so their parents cannot protect them. Some Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's also some storytelling history for you. <laughs> Nancy figures it out. She's like, Mom, you've been treating me like I'm crazy. Like I just made up this guy? She spies because she's good. She scares the monster in the face. Literally, that's the end of the first one. Film. She literally says, I know who you are, I'm not afraid of you, and I take back all the strength I gave you. And she turns her back and he's gone. Fast forward to part three, she's gone to grad school. The last day Elm Street kids are in a mental institution where all their parents have put them because they've been committing suicide. And what did the doctors and the parents blame? You guessed it. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Does this sound familiar to what I just said at the start of this talk? At the start of this talk? That's a horror movie. Speaking the truth, it shouldn't surprise us, though, because Wes Craven, the director and co-writer, philosophy professor, before he was a director. <laughs> yes. Go, English nerd, for you again. <laughs> for me, too, English major. I'm, I'm a proud English nerd. And Nancy finally goes to these kids after one by one they've been killed, and she says, I know who's trying to kill you. And, she, and they're like, don't believe us, girl. We are not in the and she describes him. And they're like, okay, what are you going to do? And she tells them, here's how we meet him. And this is the advice we've got to start giving our students. Our students, not just your children. Our students. I have no kids. Our students. She says to those, to those teenagers that inside each one of them is a special gift, a skill drive, purpose. And she begs them to tap into it. And then she says, and if we can do that as a collective, if we can all come together and use those gifts, we can beat this guy. Spoiler, they do. We have got to start telling our kids that inside them, and we 
we've got to start doing it early. Early. Kindergarten. We need to say thank you. You are special. And we don't need to tell them to go be English majors or to go be business majors. We need to ask them, what do you like to do? What makes you want to get out of bed in the morning? What brings you joy? What brings you happiness? And then guide that kiddo to college and career readiness. Another spoiler, OCCC, the kiddos, if they graduate from Oklahoma City Public Schools, they go tuition free to that community college. You know, when Tennessee did this, when they made their community college free, they made national news. What is wrong with us that we have not publicized this? I don't know what happened. You guys are publicizing it. I'm working with OCCC to see the city of OKC can do this work with the public wow. sector. Metro Tech, if they go to the Oklahoma City Public Schools, they go to the Metro Tech's tuition free. The answers are staring us right in the face. They're staring us in the face. The answers are not standardized tests. The answers are not asking our counselors, as the three that we had at Jefferson, to focus on standardized tests and to focus on enrollment. It is to help them understand the traumas they have experienced yeah. and not make them victims to those traumas. But like Nancy, ask those kids to stare those traumas in the face and to learn how to manage them. Because manage them, they must over the rest of their adult lives. That's so good. Yeah. This is the message. This is what I will repeat over and over and over again. When you all invested in Plaza and Paseo, when you invested on 23rd Street, when you invested here on Automobile Alley, you brought back to life like a true renaissance, our urban court. That's what helped me get out of bed this morning, was knowing that I'm not alone in this life. That's what did. You <coughs> can't do this alone. The Paseo was the first commercial shopping district built outside of downtown in 1929. We were coming up on Spanish Village, it's called. <laughs> Back then, to convince people to move out, out there to the country, <laughs> true. G.A. Nichols, the developer, said, okay, I got it. There will be sidewalks guiding you from your front door to the basic needs of the individual, the grocery store, the cleaners, the parks of recreation, the schools, the harbors, and in the event that that neighborhood did not meet the basic needs, there would be reliable public transit connecting you back to the part of town that did. Back then, that's what the median on Classen was, the streetcar. That was Anton Classen and John Chartel. That's our city's founders. That was the private sector also. We've done it before. We've thrived before. And with Max Horror, that history is what I invested in when I created with Council Person Ken the sidewalk, trail, bike lane, and street bike package in there. I said, well, let's put some sidewalks in where we are lowest income folks can live, where we can connect to parks, where we can connect to schools, where we can connect to transit. Let's do that. over the next eight years in our city's existence. Yeah. There will be a bus traffic transit on Classen that will come from downtown. This is outside of Maps Ward. That will go along the old streetcar route. Every 15 minutes, there will be a bus that looks like a streetcar. I don't know. I didn't make it up. <laughs> and it will go from downtown along the old streetcar route, connecting Plaza, connecting Military Park, Paseo, you name it, and then turn west Northwest Expressway in Meridian. There will be a parking right there for people to park their cars and hop on. It's when you have to look at your watch. I think 15 minutes will be there for you. And then it will connect you to the streetcar. And then all of a sudden, the people who don't live in Bricktown, downtown, and midtown, that streetcar will finally make sense to them. Yeah. Yeah. And Max Four, we went further and said, let's put two more of these. One connecting downtown to the northeast side, yeah. out to the Oklahoma County Health Department. Connecting you to Tinseltown, the Cowboy Hall of Fame, Remington Park, Science Museum, the Zoo, the Metro Tech. Remember that Metro Tech and how important I think it is for our kiddos' future? Two downtown. One to the south side, connecting to Capitol Hill and to Integris. We will have 15 minute bus frequency in a way we've never had before. And there's a whole list of projects I would encourage you to go to Maps or OKC and that Google again after you type in adverse childhood experience. The 
the investment you just made from the public side of your infrastructure is critical. But the investment you can make from the private sector in historic shopping districts like Paseo, like Plaza, like Old Downtown Bridge, like the stockyards, like the historic Clara Weaver Court between 3rd Street, for those babies and that teacher marked to desegregate the city for anyone else in the country. 1959. Yeah. 1959. Yeah. It's time we honor the fact that through terror, through the terror of lynching, through the terror of booms and busts that come with the oil cycle, through the terror of the bombing, we are a resilient people. Yeah. We might get knocked down, but we get back up. And we get back up, we must begin. The Renaissance story is not complete just the investment from the private sector, the public sector, and infrastructure. The Renaissance is not complete until we have a renaissance in education, in thinking, in critical thinking, and going all the way back to Socrates and teaching our students how to think for her and himself. Yes. Only then will we be in a true renaissance. You don't let them tell you otherwise. It's lipstick on a pig. I have faith in us as a people. I would not have run for office if I did not believe that together we could make these sorts of investments. Yeah. I've done my part, and I will do my part to continue speaking to this, and I'm begging you to talk to your kiddos, talk to our students about their self-worth, remind them who's come before them in this city, and ask them to rise to the high tides. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you this morning. Charlie Christian, 
There's no Ralph Ellison without that moment. Right. So that was in the head, John, when I got to craft the curriculum for my college preparation students. So in my class, I taught my students, we would read the lyrics to the song Royals or to Kendrick Lamar's Confession. And I would teach them that on their standardized test, it would look something like that. There would be a passage about the lyrics of a song. And if we just figured out how to analyze these songs for meaning, that would help them. And it did. And then I went one further. And this, they taught me, you gotta listen to the kids sometimes. I saw that they were on their phones all the time playing games. And I saw that they knew things like Fortnite, which I still haven't played. Uh, and I was like, but I have played video games, I played Zelda. <laughs> <laughs> so I literally brought into class the Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. And I let them play in 10 minute increments while the other students took notes on the gameplay, on the story. They learned exposition that way. They learned rising action that way. They learned climax that way. They learned falling action that way. They learned resolution that way. They learned what a tyrant was that way. Because that's who they have to defeat in the game. They learned protagonists. I linked it to the yeah. Odyssey. Yeah. I linked it to the Iliad. I don't think they're ever going to forget it now. So I think, John, the answer was I took from our own history taught them that history, yeah. told them who we are, and by extension, who they are. I took my own ideas, the music we brought them in, and I listened to them. Uh, and then that I brought the video games in. And also, don't think I'm perfect on this. I'm sure most of you in there probably already know that, but uh, they still fail. They're teenagers, they're down that, you know. But I can tell you this, even when they would talk over me or over each other or not do exactly what I wanted to do, I never wrote a single officer book. Wow. I never suspended a single kid. You have to build relationships with yep. these kids. The local news gets it so wrong. No offense if you work for them. <laughs> but let's talk. <laughs> these are not discipline problems. Yep. Our kids are not discipline problems. Mm -hmm. They are students who have experience of trauma. I know that might sound to some of you like, and that's fine, think that. But they are students who have experienced trauma and they have not been able thusly to develop the part of their brain yeah. that allows them to reason. Those emotions are all fighting with that animated film, Inside Out, mm -hmm. yeah. which is a brilliant film. Yeah. Brilliant film. Show that to the kids yeah. in class. Use that to teach them what's happening in here. Because right now, there's no classes that are really doing that. Mm -hmm. And because that's not happening, they're not learning how to reason when a conflict is happening. And then you get a shooting intense for a moment, yeah. over a pub. So until we teach these kids how to reason out their ideas, their emotions, I don't think anything changes. And that cycle of violence will continue. That's good. Distant dream, distant memory. 
in the moment problems, right? Um, and so when Debbie Martin and I went and spoke with the president of Oak Trip, we were like, ask how can we help? And he was so excited that we came. He was so excited. And so we're going to be regrouping with him and the vice president of Human Affairs to see what the city of OPC can do to help campaign on this fact that this is something our kids have access to. That's what I'm working on right now.